um, you know, take a look at whatever questions you might have. Okay, well, let's get started. This is chapter 10 in chemistry 111. This is um, chemical bonding two, molecular geometry and hybridization of atomic or orbitals. So sort of two parts to this chapter. Now, the first part of the chapter, we're gonna focus almost exclusively on molecular geometry. And the way that I introduce this to my students is, let's say I have a central atom, okay? And I call that atom A, okay? And I wanna to attach two atoms to it, okay? I wanna attach two X's to it. If I were to put two bonds, so I make a bond like this to element X and I make a bond to element X like this, is you can see that the way I've drawn it, it looks like there's a 90 degree bond angle here. But the idea is that in this bond, there are two electrons and in this bond, there are two electrons. My question is, is this the furthest that these pairs of electrons can get away from each other? Because since electrons are all negative, they're gonna repel each other. We know that like charges repel. And the answer is yes, the electrons can get further away from each other than that, okay? So this would not be a preferred molecular geometry. In fact, the way that those three atoms are gonna be connected is you're gonna see that those two bonds to element X are gonna get as far away from each other as possible and you're gonna end up with a bond angle of 180 degrees, okay? Because again, the two electrons in here and the two electrons in here are gonna repel each other as much as possible. And we call that valence shell electron pair repulsion or VSEPR for short. Okay, so VSEPR theory. It says here that VSEPR, it says, predict the geometry of the molecule from the electrostatic repulsions between the electrons, whether they're bonding and bonding um, pairs. So when we're talking about bonding electrons, okay, those could be in a single bond, they could be in a double bond or they could be in a triple bond. Okay, so each one of those counts as one group of bonds. And non-bonding pairs, well, the idea is you could either have a lone pair or just a single unpaired electron, we call it a radical. And we don't look at a lot of radicals in this class. Well, here we go. Let's start, you know, get the ball rolling here. Here's the first class that we're gonna look at in terms of what we call molecular geometry. If I have something like this, AB2, A, a is the central atom, the atom in the center, and B is the peripheral atom, okay? So um, as long as A is the central atom, of course, B is gonna be the atoms on the periphery. Number of atoms bonded to the central atom. Well, we obviously have two of them. Number of lone pairs. Notice it doesn't say anything about lone pairs. We use B for the, um, we'll put here outer, outer atoms. Now notice that there's no lone pairs. If there were lone pairs, we would write E, okay? So E, we use lone pairs, and we're not even talking about lone pairs yet, okay? We will talk about central atoms that have lone pairs, but again, not there yet. So again, just like I told you on the last slide, you've got a central atom, and it's surrounded by two atoms. What's the furthest they can get away from each other? It's gonna be linearly, and they're gonna adopt a bond angle of 180 degrees. And so the way that you name this molecular geometry, which describes the shape, of this molecule would be linear. Can you give me an example of that? You know, can you give me an example of a linear molecule? Absolutely, I can. If we look at beryllium chloride, so we spent enough time looking at nomenclature in this class, and the nomenclature comes up every lecture in general chemistry. Beryllium chloride is BeCl2. Where's beryllium? It's the fourth element in the periodic table. If you look at the electron configuration of beryllium, it's 1s2, 2s2. So that means the Lewis structure of beryllium, it's got two unpaired electrons like that, okay? So everybody should be able to draw the Lewis structure of beryllium chloride, which is shown right here because chlorine, right? It has seven valence electrons, it's in the halogens. And of course, the beryllium is gonna form bonds, right? Like this with the, with the chlorine atoms like that. And then of course we represent what I have in those in those oval shapes, we represent those as bonds, right? B, E, C, L, two. So I have a central atom, beryllium, it's surrounded by two atoms, the two chlorines. There's no lone pairs in the central atom. We're not even talking about lone pairs yet. We'll get to that. So what's the bond angle gonna be? Again, it's gonna be 180 degrees. And we call this molecular geometry or this shape, we call it linear. So we'll say here, um, molecular geometry, I'll put MG is linear. 
linear like that. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on linear. All right, awesome, good. First, first molecular geometry that you look at. Well, now we're gonna step it up a notch. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about what would happen if you had a central atom, but it was surrounded by three different atoms. Okay, well, again, if you have a central point, A, and it's surrounded by three atoms, no lone pairs, we're not talking about lone pairs yet. I mean, what's the furthest they're gonna get, get away from each other? It's that the three outer atoms are gonna occupy the three points of an equilateral triangle like this, okay? So basically you're gonna have, you know, your central atom, A, and you're gonna have those three bonds spread out equally. So if we take a circle to 360 degrees and we divide it by three, what do we get? We're gonna have a bond angle of 120 degrees. Okay, and we have a name for that. It's trigonal, which means it's got like a, a, a three points of a triangle. And planar, what does planar mean? Planar means that it's flat. Okay, so trigonal, that's pretty obvious. And planar means that it's flat. Because we're going to look at several planar geometries. But trigonal planar means it's completely fat, flat. All right. So now we've got two molecular geometries. We have a central atom surrounded by two atoms. They're going to adopt a linear molecular geometry. If we have three atoms surrounding a central atom, they're going to have the trigonal planar molecular geometry. Now, before we move on, I want to point out something really important here. Where it says arrangement of electron pairs. They're the same, right? Linear and linear, trigonal planar and trigonal planar. But what we're going to see is that later on, we're going to see that there's going to be differences between these two. The arrangement of electron pairs and the molecular geometry. Mr. Dion, Instead of calling it the arrangement of electron pairs, I like to call it the electron geometry. Okay, electron geometry, and I like to call the other one molecular geometry, of course. Okay, anyhow, so electron geometry considers electron geometry considers bonds and lone pairs. Okay, both molecular geometry, on the other hand, considers only bonds okay if there's one thing you need to have memorized before you go home this evening if you're not home already is this electron geometry or the arrangement of electron pairs refers to bonds and lone pairs we haven't even looked at any lone pairs yet have we but we're going to and molecular geometry refers to only bonds so once we start looking at structures where we have lone pairs in the central atom the difference between these two is going to be important Okay, so you're going to have to understand both of them. So I have a question. So far, we've talked about um, an atom, a central atom, surrounded by two atoms. And we said that it has a linear geometry like this. Okay, straight line. You have a bond angle of 180 degrees. Next, we talked about having a central point with, you know, three atoms around it. And we said, okay, well, it uh, the, the three points are going to, Occupy the three points of an equilateral triangle. Their bond angles will be 120 degrees. Not much of a stretch. I have a question for you. If I have a central atom surrounded by four atoms, what would be the angle between, you know, in the bonds such that I could get those atoms as far apart from each other as possible? What shape would they take on? Could anybody comment on that? If I have a central atom surrounded by four atoms, how are they going to get as far away from each other as possible? What kind of shape would it take up? Somebody says a pyramid, somebody says a pyramid. Yeah, somebody says tetrahedral. So um, I'll be completely frank with you. Many times when I've taught this, you know, in front of a live class, uh, students will oftentimes answer and they'll say, it would occupy the four corners of a square. Okay, I have four corners of a square, 90 degree angles, and that's as far away, you know, as everything can get. And that's not true, right? As Bruce said, the bond angles are going to be 109.5. And when you have a central atom surrounded by four atoms, they're actually going to adopt this molecular geometry here, which is called a tetrahedron. Okay. Or this shape is called a tetrahedron. And we say the molecular geometry is tetrahedral. Here's my central atom. I have one, two, three, four atoms surrounding it. And that bond angle 
this bond angle here, this bond angle here, all of the bond angles, this bond angle here, this bond angle, all of those bond angles are exactly the same. And this is a number you have to remember. Okay, it's a number you've got to have memorized and it's 109.5. Okay, that is the bond angle, all of the bond angles in the tetrahedron, which might be a new shape for some of you, um, is 109.5 degrees. So you need to be fully aware of what a tetrahedron is and what the bond angles are. This is where models come in really handy. Um, and if you don't have a set of models at home, you can buy some from Amazon. You can get a really cheap molecular model kit that would um, you know, have everything. Can you guys see my screen again? I just wanna double check before I start plowing through material here. Uh, all right, thanks. All right, perfect. Well, let's take a look. Um, before we move on to that, I guess I forgot one thing is that, you know, we were talking about trigonal planar and what would be an example of trigonal planar? It would be BF3, boron trifluoride. So BF3, boron is in group 3A. It has one, two, three valence electrons. Fluorine is in group 7A, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if we draw our Lewis structure, BF3, like this, maybe I could do a little neater, okay? You know, how are those three fluorines gonna get as away, away from each other as, as, far, as far as possible? They're all gonna have a bond angle of 120 degrees like that. So we call that trigonal, trigonal planar. All right, that's the molecular geometry. So where I was going was to the tetrahedron. Okay, if I have a central atom surrounded by four atoms, no lone pairs, we're not there yet, okay? all the bond angles are gonna be 109.5 degrees. And again, sometimes I've seen students answer this. They say, well, Mr. Dion, I'm gonna have, you know, linear in this direction, and then I'm gonna have linear in this direction, right? And all the bond angles are gonna be 90 degrees. That in fact would be very, very incorrect, okay? Now, the tetrahedron is actually, or sorry, when the four atoms occupy the, the four corners of a tetrahedron, that is the furthest away they can get from each other. So the tetrahedral shape, and again, you need to know that bond angle, 109.5 degrees. Okay, so there we go. We've already covered the first three. It's almost over, right? We've covered a lot of ground already. Now, if there's anybody here who took Chemistry 101 here at PPCC, you would have been introduced to the tetrahedron. And here's an example. You know, if you say, give me an example, Mr. Dion, of a tetrahedral molecule or a molecule that has tetrahedral molecular geometry. A perfect example would be methane, which is CH4. Carbon is in group 4A, it has four valence electrons. Hydrogen has only one valence electron. So they're gonna adopt this kind of shape right here. So if I said, hey, draw me a Lewis structure of methane. And if you drew this, okay, if you put everything in the plane of the board here like this, if you drew this as a Lewis structure, just a plain old run of the mill Lewis structure, I would say that's perfect. There's nothing wrong with that. What's the problem though? Lewis structures don't show us the shape of a molecule, do they? If you look at this, it looks like it's square and planar, right? It looks like it's totally flat, but we know that these four groups, this bond, this bond, this bond, this bond, are gonna get as far away from each other as possible. And so a more correct representation of the methane molecule would look something like this. I'm gonna have my carbon in the center. I'll put my hydrogen at the top. I'll put another hydrogen in the plane of the page. And we're gonna use a dash to show that we have a hydrogen going in back. Like this, so the dash, the dash means in back or behind the page. And we call this a wedge. And the wedge means it's coming, you know, in front, in front. So we'll put the wedge like this, okay? There we go. And again, we know that all of these bond angles are 109.5 degrees. You notice that my wedge is backwards from theirs. Okay, mine you know, gets bigger as it goes away from the carbon and theirs gets smaller. That's just a preference, doesn't matter. You can do it either way, it's, it's fine. Okay, so methane is an example of a tetrahedral molecule. And there are many you know, tetrahedral molecules out there. Okay, so what I was saying before is if you're in chemistry 101, uh, here at PPCC, and I'm sure that there's somebody who took that class, you know, chemistry 101. Um, we teach molecular geometry in that class, but this is where you would have stopped. You would have stopped at the tetrahedron and said, okay, well, we're not going to look at any more shapes beyond this. But I'm here to tell you that there are shapes beyond this. 
what if I had a central atom and it was surrounded by five atoms? Well, how would they get as far away from each other as possible? Well, the shape that they're going to adopt is called a trigonal bipyramidal shape. See, it comes from trigonal because we have a triangle in the middle and then bipyramidal because it's like we have two pyramids, right? We have a pyramid on top and we have a pyramid on bottom. I can show you what that looks like because I made a model of it. Here's my trigonal by, by pyramid here. Okay. So if you look down, you know, well, let's just look at it like this. Okay. So you see how we have a triangle right here. And then if you close this or if you get rid of that, it kind of looks like you have a pyramid on the top and then you have a pyramid on the bottom. So that's where we get the name trigonal from the center atoms by pyramidal pyramid on the top pyramid on the bottom. Okay. If you look down from the top atom to the bottom atom like this, you can actually see the triangle like that. The bond angles of the atoms that are in the middle here, those are all 120 degrees. But the bond angle between the top atom and the bottom atom is 180 degrees. And the bond angle between the atom on the top and the ones in the middle, that's 90 degrees. So the atoms that are in the middle, the ones that form the triangle, are a little bit different than the ones that form the, 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 um, uh, the vertical axis here, okay? And we call these atoms, these three atoms that form the triangle, we call those the equ equatorial positions, okay? You get, an, you get another word, okay? Equatorial, think about it. Equator, it's the middle of the earth. Equatorial, okay? So it's kind of the center, you know, going around like this because later on we're going to look at what happens if I replace one of these atoms with a lone pair of electrons and we're going to remove an atom from the equatorial position. OK, all right. So there we go. So that's the trigonal by pyramid. Let's go back to the slides here. Oops. Do that. Where am I? Boop, boop, boop. There we go. All right. So the trigonal by pyramid again, this, you know, it's not very big, but you can see here that the bond angle between Remember, these three positions are equatorial positions, okay? So the bond angle between, you know, the, the poles and the equatorial positions, that's 90 degrees. The bond angle between the two poles is 180 degrees, like that. And the bond angle between, you know, the equatorial positions is 120 degrees. So the trigonal bipyramidal shape molecular geometry. Kind of cool. Give me an example of a trigonal bipyramidal molecule. Okay, what about phosphorus pentatoid? P C L five. Phosphorus is in group five A. It's got one, two, three, four, five unpaired or um, five valence electrons. Chlorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. Now phosphorus is in the third period, so it can expand its octet. If I want to show those five chlorines getting as far away from each other as possible, I'll draw two on the two extremes or the poles, as I was calling them. And then for the three in the middle, the equatorial positions, I'll draw one going in the back like this. And if you're wondering, hey, Mr. Dio, does it matter if I draw it on the left? You know, could I just draw it? Could I draw them going back or one going back like this? You know, draw the other one coming out in front like that and then draw one. Yeah, no problem. Either way is totally fine. Okay, so that's trigonal bipyramidal. We have all the bond angles here. Oh, we're missing this one here, which is 180 degrees. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the trigonal bipyramid. Or let me know if you have a question about the trigonal bipyramid. All right. Yeah, just looking at shapes, right? You know, something um, that I found teaching molecular geometry over the years is that if you're the kind of student, is if anybody in the class has ever built a model before, maybe a model car or something, or worked on a car engine maybe, or any kind of activity where you're looking at instructions on paper, you know, just in two dimensions, and then you have to go over to, you know, a car engine or something and look at it in three dimensions, and then you go back to a piece of paper again. I find that students who have practice in that oftentimes excel 
in uh, in molecular geometry. Well, we got one more, you know, molecular geometry that doesn't involve um, lone pairs on the central atom, and that is the octahedral shape. So if we have central atom surrounded by six atoms, okay, no lone pairs. Again, we haven't talked about that. You get what's called the octahedral shape, and I don't have an octahedron, but I can make one if you just give me a second. And you notice that all of the bond angles in the octahedron, they're all identical, aren't they? They're all 90 degrees. So I'm going to make my octahedron. I'm making it from my linear model. So just give me a second here. So I need six bonds. Six atoms. It's going all over my desk. Another way you could make these models, and I'm you're gonna might think that I'm kidding, but I am not kidding at all. If you have party balloons in your house, I mean literally, you know, a bag of 99 cent balloons from the dollar store. If you take two balloons and tie them together, what you're gonna see is that they're gonna try to adopt a linear shape, right? They're gonna get as far away from each other as possible. If you take three of them, they're gonna adopt a trigonal planar shape. If you take four of them and tie them together, they'll adopt a tetrahedral shape. So you can actually just use a party balloon instead of you know, spending your money on a molecular model kit. Where was I? Uh, there we go. So here's the camera. Yeah, here's my octahedron. Here, so you see, I have the central atom. We can call, you know, these equatorial atoms, but the thing is, it doesn't matter how you rotate it. All the bond angles are 90 degrees, right? I can throw it up in the air, well, and just pick whichever one I want, well, you know. Hey, you know, it doesn't matter which one I grab. I'm gonna end up with the same thing every time. And you can see how the bond angles are all 90 degrees. These angles are 90 degrees. This angle is 90 degrees, except for, you know, the two extremes here. Um, these would be, you know, 180 degrees like that. But that's the octahedral shape. P pretty cool, huh? Very cool shape, the octahedron. Um, give me a sec. Rifling in between the screen broadcast and using my camera this evening. There we go. So let's get to it and let's look at an example of an octahedral molecule, and that would be sulfur hexafluoride. You can Google videos of people inhaling sulfur hexafluoride and then talking, and it makes them sound like Darth Vader because sulfur hexafluoride is so dense. Anyhow, uh, sulfur hexafluoride. So sulfur is in the third period, so it can expand its octet. Sulfur has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Fluorine has seven. You know, one unpaired electron, so SF6 is going to look like this, you know, um, where I'm going to have some fluorines going back, other ones coming out in front. If I draw my, oct no, I got hydrogen on the brain. If I draw my octahedral shape correctly, it's going to look something like this. Okay, put in all my lone pairs, you know. We have the saying in organic chemistry, friends don't let friends leave lone pairs out, right? Anyhow, yeah, you can see that all the bond angles are 90 degrees, except for the two, you know, two of if you choose two extremes like this, you get a bond angle of 180 degrees. You might be wondering, hey, uh, Mr. B, do you have a summary of all this? You know, there's a lot of information. Yeah, sure. It's table 10.1 in your textbook. So if you have the textbook, which I hope you do, you could just uh, photocopy this or you could write it down on a piece of paper to help you memorize it. There's a lot of um, kinesthetic learning that can be done. Just by writing things down, it helps people to memorize things. And what do you have to know? You have to know, um, it says here, arrangement of electron pairs. Oops, arrangement of electron pairs about a central atom, molecular geometry, no lone pairs, okay? This is very important. This table has nothing to do with lone pairs. No lone pairs. Because we're going to look at examples that have lone pairs, and it gets a little bit more complicated, actually. All right, so if we have two bonds, it's going to have a linear molecular geometry and a linear electron geometry. If you have three pairs, sorry, three bonds, it's going to have trigonal planar. Four, it's tetrahedral. Bond angles are all 109.5. You have five. Then you have the trigonal bipyramid. You've got bond angles of 120 and 90. And if you're surrounded by six atoms, then you have the octahedral shape. And all the bond angles will be 90 degrees. There we go. Give me a thumbs up if you're like, yeah, this molecular geometry stuff's not that bad. Spent a lot of time studying my 
Lewis structure. So I feel like as long as I draw my Lewis structure correctly, I should be able to uh, muscle, muscle my way through some molecular geometry. Good. Awesome. Molecular geometry is really fun, in my opinion. You know, looking at the shapes of molecules, and it actually helps you understand their reactivity. Well, let me uh, go back to my camera here for a sec. There we go. Okay, well, let's go back to our tetrahedron here. Okay, so remember, molecular geometry only deals with bonds, just bonds. Okay, so if I look at the tetrahedron here, this atom is surrounded by four atoms. The central atom is surrounded by four outer atoms. And so my molecular geometry is tetrahedral. What would happen if I took one of those bonds off and I replaced it with a lone pair? Okay. My electron geometry is still tetrahedral, isn't it? Right? This thing here, this lobe represents a lone pair. Why? Because I said that electron geometry considers both bonds and lone pairs. The one, two, three bonds and one lone pair. So my electron geometry is still tetrahedral. Right? I've got two electrons in this bond, two electrons here, two electrons here, and two electrons in the lone pair. They're all trying to get as far away from each other as possible. Okay. But what about my molecular geometry? I said that molecular geometry only considered bonds. If you look at those three bonds, that's not a tetrahedron, is it? It's trigonal, but it's not flat, okay? And we call that molecular geometry trigonal pyramidal, right? It's like a pyramid. You can see how it goes up like that, and it's trigonal in shape. So again, electron geometry is tetrahedral. Molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. All right. What would happen if I replaced another one of those bonds with another lone pair? Got two lone pairs now. Duh. Okay. What's my molecular, or sorry, what's my electron geometry? It's still tetrahedral, isn't it? Look, I've got two electrons here, two electrons here, two electrons in this lone pair, and two electrons in this lone pair. My molecular geometry is, or sorry, my electron geometry is still tetrahedral. But what's my molecular geometry? It only considers bonds, okay? It only considers bonds. We call this a bent shape. It's not a tetrahedron. It's not a trigonal pyramid either. It's just bent. So when we have two bonds and two lone pairs, we call that a bent molecular geometry. When I have three bonds and one lone pair, I call that trigonal pyramidal. Look at this slide here. It says tetrahedral bond angles. Okay. Well, what's an example of a molecule that has a central atom and four bonds? Methane, right? CH4. No lone pairs. All of those bond angles are going to be exactly 109.5 degrees. Well, what happens if you have a molecule like ammonia, NH3? Remember, ammonia has one lone pair and one, two, three bonds like that. Maybe I should move the Lewis structure over a little bit. Okay, so ammonia looks like this. It's got one, two, three bonds and one lone pair. So the correct way to represent that molecular geometry would be to say you get one hydrogen in front, one in back, and one coming out here like this. And then I'll put the lone pair on the end of a stick like that. It's not a bond, but just to show that the lone pair takes up space. Well, what's my bond angle going to be then? You look at it here, it says it's 107.3. All of you need to know in this class is that it's less than 109.5 degrees. Now, why would that be? I'll show you why. I go back to my trigonal pyramidal molecule. What happens is the two electrons in the lone pair, they aren't being shared, are they? These two electrons are shared, these two electrons in this bond are shared, and these two electrons in this bond are shared. So what that lone pair is going to do, it's going to push these bonds, it's going to push them down by repulsion. It's going to push them a little closer together. And so instead of being 109.5, the bond angle is going to be a little smaller. You can probably guess it's going to happen if I have a bent molecular geometry. 
Now I've got two lone pairs and those are gonna push these two atoms even closer together. So if I have a molecule like water, H2O, we draw the Lewis structure, you can see the central atom has two bonds and two lone pairs. How would I draw that? Well, the way that they have it drawn here, I could draw it a little bit different, doesn't matter. I'll put the two bonds in the plane of the screen and I'll draw one lone pair going in the back and another lone pair going in the front. And so that's gonna push these two hydrogen atoms together a little bit more. Again, for this class, all you have to know is that the bond angle is less than 109.5 degrees. You don't have to have 107.3 and 104.5 memorized. If you want to, be my guest because they come up probably a few times in the textbook. What's the take home message from this slide? Bonding. If we compare a bonding pair versus a bonding pair, so that means a bond versus a bond, it's going to have less repulsion than if I have a lone pair in a bond, right? And that's going to have even less repulsion than if I have a lone pair and a lone pair. Why would the lone pair have more repulsion? I've already explained it. I'm just repeating myself. The reason the lone pair is going to have even more repulsion than a bond is because these electrons are not shared, right? They're just ready to repel whatever the hell comes near them, whereas electrons in a bond are shared, okay? They can participate in repulsion, but they're also participating in forming a bond. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the, the new molecular geometry that we've learned. So these are all molecular geometries. Okay. Remember, for all three of these, the electron geometry or the arrangement of electron pairs, electron geometry for all is still tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. Why? Because electron geometry considers bonds and lone pairs. Okay. Another way that we have of describing bonds and lone pairs is we call them regions of electron density. Red, R E D. Okay. Let me just kind of run that by you before we keep going here. Um, this is something that you're going to see later on is REDs, regions of electron density. A RED can be a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, a lone pair, or a radical. Each one of these counts as one region of electron density. So what if I have that trigonal planar molecule and I replace one of the atoms with a lone pair. Then I'm going to have something that looks like this. And if my central atom, I'll have the electrons up here, A to E. I'm just going to replace it with a lone pair like this. And then I'm going to have two. Atoms. Okay. Well, what's going to happen is that the lone pair and the two bonds are going to seek to get as far away from each other as possible. They're going to adopt a bond angle here. It's going to be close to 120 degrees. Now, if you're like, well, shouldn't this be pushing these this way a little bit more so it's less than 120? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But again, our electron geometry, even though we have a lone pair, is still trigonal planar. Why? Because arrangement of electron pairs or electron geometry considers bonds and lone pairs, whereas molecular geometry considers bonds and nothing else. So, what's my shape what's my molecular geometry well it only considers the bonds and we could, we're going to call this a bent molecular geometry an example of a bent molecule having three regions of electron density or two bonds and one lone pair would be sulfur dioxide the lewis structure for sulfur dioxide looks something like this i have a, two double bonds in a lone pair on the sulfur. Remember, a double bond is a region of electron density. I've got two of those. And a lone pair is a region of electron density. So I've got three regions of electron density. If I have three regions of electron density, my arrangement of electron pairs or my electron geometry is trigonal planar. 
However, molecular geometry only considers bonds, doesn't it? So it's only going to consider this part of the molecule, and the shape is bent. All right. Now, if we move on to the tetrahedron, again, what happens if we replace one of those central, sorry, one of those outer atoms with a lone pair? We've gone over this already. You end up with a trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. All right, if I draw my ammonia molecule again, I've got a lone pair, a hydrogen, I've got another hydrogen going in the back, and I've got one coming out in front like this. My electron geometry or my arrangement of electron pairs is still tetrahedral because it considers bonds and lone pairs, but my molecular geometry only considers the bonds. And so it is trigonal pyramidal. We already looked at what happens if you replace two of the outer atoms with two lone pairs. Then you get something like water, right? Where water has, you know, you always see water drawn like this. You know, even people who don't know anything about chemistry sometimes draw water, you know, and they'll draw it with this angle like this. There's a reason why they draw it with a bent shape, even without knowing. Um, the reason why they do that is because the water molecule has two lone pairs. Where are those lone pairs going to be? Well, if the two hydrogens are in the plane of the screen, that means that one of the lone pairs is going to be in the back. And another lone pair is going to be coming out in the front like this. The bond angle less than 109.5 degrees in the molecular geometry is going to be bent. Notice that bent shows up a couple of times. We have bent for water, which has two bonds and and we also have bent, or was it, for our sulfur dioxide, didn't we? Even though the bond angle is pretty different, right? The bond angle here is going to be around, you know, 120. -ish. The bond angle in water, which is also bent, is less than 109.5. So there's a little bit of a difference there. OK, before we move on to five regions of electron density, just let me know if you follow me up to this point. Now it gets you know, a little more interesting. All right. Well, now we're going to get into some shapes that I think, personally, I think are a little funkier. Okay, a little funkier, a little more interesting shapes. Let's go back to our trigonal bipyramidal shape. Remember this guy when we had a central atom surrounded by five atoms? You know, something looks like this. I'll just redraw it. So if we have our central atom, we had two atoms that were 180 degrees apart from each other right we had something else in the plane like this and then we had you know oops i don't know why now i got bromine on the brain Jeepers. so no still have bromine on the brain there we go we have b over here and we have bromine over here i like to use x's over b's because b is an element so you boron anyhow which might screw up but remember i told you that the atoms that are in the center, okay, these are the equatorial position. Equatorial. All right. When you start replacing atoms in here with lone pairs, like let's say we replaced one of the atoms with a lone pair, you always take and replace equatorial atoms. So replace equatorial. Equatorial, equatorial atoms. Okay, so whenever we take an atom, we're not going to take this one off here. Okay, we're always going to take one of the equatorials. I could take this. It doesn't matter. I could take this one, this one, or this one. It doesn't matter at all. Well, let's say I took off, you know, the one that has the word equatorial written next to it. Okay, let's say I took that off, and I replaced that with a lone pair. Well. Molecular geometry only considers bonds. What kind of shape is that? Let me get my models out for you here. Here's my model. So here's my um, trigonal bipyramidal. I'm going to remove one of the equatorials. I'll replace it with a pink lone pair. 
and what shape do I get? You get this cool shape. Now, in the slides, if you still have the slides open or if you have them printed out, you'll notice that it says distorted, uh, whatever. It says distorted tetrahedron, which is totally fine. I mean, it's in the book and it's in my slides, so it must be correct, okay? Sometimes we call that the distorted tetrahedron. There's an even easier way to name it though, okay? If you think about it like this, it's impossible for me to do because my screen isn't flat, it's got an angle. We call this the seesaw. Imagine this on the playground. Look at this, this is, this is good teaching. Seesaw, okay, I can even, can even put, it on the, put it on my desk here. Where the hell is it? There it is, okay, seesaw. So that's the seesaw shape. So either you can call it a distorted tetrahedron, you can call it a seesaw. I don't care. All right. Either one is perfectly fine, but you should know both. Now, where were we? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on seesaw. All right. The good old seesaw. All right. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Bruce. Good. Julius, Trevor, gang, whoever's out there in TV land. Okay. So now we got a new one. You ready? Let's keep going. We're not done. We got the ways to go. What if I was to remove two of those central atoms? Okay, well, let's think about it. Let me go back. You know, I'll just copy and paste what I had drawn over here. Let me uh, copy this. A copy. How do you do that? Copy. And then we're going to go over here. We're going to. How do you paste? There we go. Okay, if I was to remove another one of those. Let me spruce it up here for you. What if I um, remove both of these guys over here? Okay. Let's imagine. Let me delete all this stuff out. Okay. Let's imagine. And then the reason I'm doing this is it's easier to see. If I have my B over here, I don't know why my B has a bunch of lone pairs around it because it doesn't necessarily have to. But anyhow, if this was a lone pair and this is a lone pair, then what's the molecular geometry? Well, hopefully it's easy to see that it looks like the letter T, right? It's got what's called a T shape. Here's my distorted tetrahedron or my seesaw. If I rip off another lone pair and I replace it, or sorry, another atom and I replace it with another lone pair, what do I get? Okay, it looks like the letter T, T shape. That's it, T shape. All right, T-shape, and you can see that the T-shape doesn't have perfect 90 degree angles, does it? Okay, the way that I have it drawn here, it looks like everything's hunky-dory, like it's all 90 degrees. Well, that's not true. Of course, it's gonna be less than 90 degrees because you've got two lone pairs, you know, pushing these guys this way, okay? But again, if you look at all of these molecular geometries, the trigonal by a pyramid, the seesaw, so again, you can call this the C, the saw, okay, or the T-shape. Those are molecular geometries. They only consider bonds. What do you notice about their arrangement of electron pairs or their electron geometries? They're all identical. They're all trigonal bipyramidal. No. All right, there we go. So our electron geometry. Um, so what I was saying when you couldn't see my slides, sorry about that, is that if you look at all of these molecular geometries, all three of these, okay, trigonal by pyramid, seesaw and T-shape. Again, those only consider bonds. If you look at their arrangement of electron pairs or is what I like to call the electron geometries, they're all identical, right? Because electron geometries consider bonds, bonds, and lone pairs, okay? I've repeated that probably six times tonight. Reason why is because I want you to know it, okay? Okay, you might be wondering, well, what about the, um, you know, the other central atom? Could I remove the other central atom? Well, yeah, or the equatorial atom, rather. 
so that you have something that looks like this, where you just have the two atoms, you know, with the two poles, so to speak, like that. And you have a lone pair here. You replace this one with a lone pair, and you replace this one with a lone pair. I'm not going to show you the model. You can probably figure it out, but you end up with something that's linear. Okay, completely linear. Again, you've got to understand this. You've got, I've got to drive this point home. Look at these molecular geometries. Trigonal bipyramid, distorted tetrahedron, T-shaped, linear. They all have the exact same electron geometry. Okay? You've got to understand that. Now look, in order, and I'm repeating myself like an old man here, but I'm 43. I've earned the right to do that. Look, in order for you to be solid, and for me to say, hey, you know, what's the molecular geometry of this? Instead of Googling it, okay, you've got to be able to figure it out yourself. What are you going to be able to do first? Draw a good Lewis structure with no mistakes. Okay, then you start evaluating it and saying, okay, well, I have, you know, five regions of electron density, I got some lone pairs, you know, what, what's it going to be? Right, that's, how, that's your decision-making process when you're looking at molecular geometries. Well, the good news is when it comes to the octahedron, it's not nearly as complex as the uh, square, or the, sorry, trigonal bipyramidal. Um, let's go back to our octahedron. Where was it? Right here. Okay, so the octahedron, I showed you a model. If you have a central atom surrounded by six atoms, no lone pairs, you get octahedral electron geometry and molecular geometry. If I rip off one of those lone pairs, I get what's called a square, square pyramid or square pyramidal shape. Here's my octahedron. Here's my octahedron right here. Let's rip off. We, and you, you could pick any one. Just close your eyes, flip it around. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. Just rip one off. Okay. And then we're going to replace it with a lone pair. And it's going to look like that. Okay. You get a square. And it's got a peak on top. Square. Pyramidal. Sometimes you hear people call it square-based pyramidal. Whatever. Square pyramidal. There you go. We'll move on to the next one. If you remove another atom, okay, you have to move the, remove the atom that's the furthest away from it. So if you pull that one off, now you've got two lone pairs and four atoms. Now you have square planar, okay? And the bond angles will be 90 degrees. It's not a tetrahedron because the tetrahedron only had four regions of electron density. The square planar has six regions of electron density, right? Two lone pairs in pink and four bonds. Here you go. And that's, I think that's all my model making for you tonight. It's a lot of models. All right. You guys find the models helpful? I do. All right. Good. So again, we remove one bond and we replace it with a lone pair. We end up with a square pyramidal shape. And if we were to move, remove two bonds and replace them with two lone pairs, then we end up with square planar. Look, just like with the trigonal bipyramidal, all these molecular geometries are different. Octahedral, square py pyramidal, square planar. But look at the or sorry, look at the electron geometries. All identical, all octahedral. Here we go. If you want a summary of every damn thing that we've learned? It's on here. It's pretty hard to see. So I have another one here. I'm going to post this to um, the D2L so that you can have this. This is something that was put together by a colleague of mine. And again, the reds, where it says here, number of reds, reds, you know, stands for region of electron density. Okay. And a red can be either a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, a lone pair, or a radical. Each one of these counts as one region of electron density. So if I have two reds, the only possibility is to have two bonds. If I have three reds, I can either have two bonds, or sorry, three bonds, or two bonds and a lone pair. If I have four reds, three possibilities, four bonds, three bonds and a lone pair. Two bonds, two lone pairs. If I have five reds, I've got five bonds, four bonds, and one lone pair, three bonds, two lone pairs, or two bonds and three lone pairs. And then for the octahedron, I've got um, 
all these ones here. I've got octahedral, uh, square base pyramid, uh, square planar. There are other ones. If you remove, um, you remove three atoms and replace them with lone pairs from the center, you end up with a T shape. I don't know if we even look at an example like this or a linear octahedron. Uh, maybe, maybe. We'll have, I can't remember every example that we look at in this class. Anyhow, again, I'll provide you with this on Canvas or um, uh, D2L. I think it will be pretty helpful. Well, it's 5.55. We have three hours left. So let's see here. Predicting molecular geometry. What are you going to do when you're all alone in a room and you got a piece of scratch paper and you're trying to come up with some molecular geometries? First thing you're going to have to do is draw a Lewis structure, right? That's always number one. That's why you got to be rock solid on your Lewis structures. You're probably tired of hearing me say that, but hey, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Next, you're going to count the number of lone pairs in the central atom and the number of atoms bonded to that central atom. Then you're going to use Vesper theory, valence shell, electron pair, repulsion, repulsion to predict the geometry of the molecule. Remember, molecular geometry considers bonds and electron geometry, or what I call electron geometry, or what the book calls the arrangement of electron pairs. That considers bonds and lone pairs. All righty. Well, with that in mind, let's try an example. It says use Vesper. Use the Vesper model, the valence shell electron pair repulsion model, to predict the molecular geometry of the following molecules and ions. Let's start with ASH3. Let's work through this one together as a group. If I look up arsenic, element AS, it's element number 33. AS is found in group 5A. Okay, if it's found in group 5A, maybe I should write that out here. Found in Group 5A. Therefore, it has five valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five. Like that. It's got one, two, three unpaired electrons that are ready to form bonds. Hydrogen is in group 1A. It's got one valence electron, and I've got three of them, so how am I going to connect them? If I just drew a Lewis structure of ASH3, it's going to look like this. I'm going to have three bonds to hydrogen and a lone pair. The lone pair is a red, the region of electron density, and all three bonds of these. All three of these bonds are regions of electron density. So I've got a total of four regions of electron density. When I've got four regions of electron density, no matter what, my electron geometry is going to be tetrahedral. What does that mean? That means that my arsenic is going to have one, two, three, Four things bonded to it. It's got the three hydrogens, and it's going to have the lone, lone pair. That's my electron geometry. But remember, my molecular geometry only considers the bonds. Could anybody tell me what the molecular geometry is here? Three bonds and one lone pair? Trigonal pyramidal, isn't it? Trigonal pyramidal. All right. Well, it's six o'clock roughly. Why don't we take a break? And then when we come back, we're going to tackle the remaining four 